This is our maintain the track talk for Backstage and uh, the state of Backstage in 2023. Um, let's do some introduction first. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a maintainer of Backstage and work at Spotify, software engineer at Spotify. Um, I've been there for four and a bit years, maybe. And I have Patrick with me. Hello, I'm Patrick, also engineer at Spotify, maintainer of Backstage and been at Spotify as long as Ben. We actually started the same day, believe it or not. We've been friends ever since. Anyway, <laughs> so we've got a packed agenda today. Um, I want to kind of just call out that there's no real nice segues between this. So like strap in, there's a little bit of whiplash, but I'm sure we'll get through it. So um, on the project, uh, on the agenda today, we have some project updates. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's new in the software templates. Um, we've got some backend system stuff that we're going to go through as well. Patrick's going to talk on that. And then some more roadmap updates as well on what's coming later on this year. Uh, yeah, so project update. So Backstage has been around for a while and um, Spotify has been using Backstage or something similar for roughly around six years. Um, but when it was open sourced, or we open sourced it to the public in 2020, I think, so uh, March 15, which makes uh, like a few weeks ago the third birthday of Backstage. So three years ago, we released Backstage into the wild after a few uh, engineers at Spotify collaborated on a internal hack week basically to see what it would take to open source Backstage and to see if it was kind of valuable to anybody else because we'd heard kind of rumors from a lot of other companies that were building something so, something similar. Um, and I guess, you know, we kind of now know that it's kind of popular, like people like it. So in three short years, like Backstage has uh, grown into a incubating project in the CNCF uh, with more than a thousand adopters and a thousand contributors worldwide. So all of, these, all of these numbers have seen quite a large growth over the last year since the last birthday. Um, and with all this activity and uh, in the project and with more adopters, we've now got 100 open source plugins for people to use inside their own backstage project. All right, so as we've just seen, the project has grown a lot. Um, and this has, of course, also led to some challenges, in particular, how we scale development and involve the community in the project. So as part of tackling this, uh, we took a look at evolving our project governance at the end of last year. So our original governance structure was a single maintainer team, as many projects start out. Over time, we've had more teams at Spotify that came and helped build out different parts of the project. And of course, a huge number of contributors from all around the world, anything from students doing a course on open source to whole teams in large organizations. And some of these contributors have been around for a long time. They know the project very well, and they want to help out more. So with our existing governance structure, it was really tricky to help empower those of you um, that want to do that. So this is another big reason. We went back, took a look at our governance model and how we could update it. So what does the new model look like? Um, at a high level, uh, what we've done is introduced the concept of uh, project areas with isolated ownership of different parts of the project. Uh, we've also added a contributor ladder, which, which had more roles between contributor and core maintainer. So this is all based on the contributor ladder uh, template from the CNCF tag contributor strategy. And shout out to them as well. Uh, they've provided some very valuable feedback as we were going through this process. So first, let's take a look at the contributor ladder. And now, this is less of a ladder we think everybody should be climbing, and more of a order of progression for someone looking to get more involved in the project. So we start out at contributor, um, which is a wonderful world of no responsibilities or requirements. All you need to do is adhere to our code of conduct. So this section of the governance is more about just highlighting the different ways in which you can contribute to the project and get involved. Once you've been contributing for a certain amount of time, you can become an organization member. This is a lightweight way to get more involved in the project and become a member of our GitHub organization. It's a way of showing more interest and also requires you to stay an active contributor. Moving on uh, to plugin maintainer, we have the first role that has direct ownership of code in the project. So if you contribute a plugin uh, that we think is a good fit for the backstage project itself, then you can take on maintenance of that plugin, assuming that you're already, in it, already a, an org member. So this is also fairly lightweight, uh, but it does require, uh, require you to commit to maintaining this plugin uh, that you contributed. Now, mentioned uh, project areas, so naturally we do have project area maintainers as well. 
this is a role where you make a larger commitment to the project, uh, where it's expected that you spend a certain amount of time uh, working in that project area. This role might look a little bit scary, but it's, it's intending to support a wide range of experience and for maintainers in one area to work together. Uh, and also, as we onboard new project area maintainers, the core maintainers, we're here to help out uh, and, uh, and uh, get going. And last, we have the core maintainers. Um, it's the new name for what we previously just referred to as maintainers. As a core maintainer, you're expected to spend the majority of your working time towards the project. You help facilitate um, communication and solutions across the project areas. And we're also the default owners for anything that doesn't fall into a particular project area. So let's look at project areas. Um, we, don't, we didn't aim to split up everything into project areas um, from the beginning, but instead continuously work to find new areas and split things out wherever possible and where it made sense. So initially, we have the catalog, discoverability, tech talks areas. And what I'm really excited about is that we now officially have maintainers from other organizations than just Spotify. So more specifically, we got Andrew and Tom from Red Hat joining, in as, uh, joining Vincenzo as maintainers in the Helm charts area. And Jamie from VMware has joined Matt uh, in the Kubernetes project area. We'll keep expanding this list of project areas, of course. Uh, next up, we're working on uh, separating out the permission system and that uh, uh, part of the framework, as well as software templates, which Ben is going to talk about soon. Uh, if you have something that you think should be a project area and that you want to drive, come talk to us. And also, if you've been contributing to Backstage uh, you, and want to become an organization member, you can head over to our community repo and open up a request. Now over to Ben for software templates. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna go through some software template stuff now. Um, so before I get to uh, what's new um, in software templates, I just wanna give a quick recap as to the why of software templates. So Backstage has been all about solving kind of three main things from the start, which is the create, manage, and explore. So create, being able to create new things inside your organization, uh, the manage part, so being able to see everything that you kind of own or you're responsible for, um, and the explore part of being able to see everything around you inside your organization, like from other teams' perspective and what they've got running. And software templates is all about the number one in that list, which is to be able to create new components inside your organization. So I guess why? Um, Every, like every company is different. Every organization is different. Like look around you here at KubeCon in the expo hall, like the amount of companies that there is that's like solving for debugging, logging, tracing, all these different technologies, right? And then every other organization has got a different combination of these. And what we want to kind of do is make that more simple for people and engineers to get set up and get running. Because onboarding in any company is kind of hard and having to have this knowledge of getting set up and, and being able to create a new project is a challenging task for any developer, like new starter or not. And what we're trying to do here is give engineers the ability to create new software components with all of that, all your best practices built in and remove a lot of the manual steps and knowledge needed to be able to get something running. And this is what one example of software templates might look like. It is playing, right? Yes. Uh, a template author can ask for bits of information that's needed for them to create a new software component inside their organization. So, in this particular template, we've got some accompanying boilerplate or like blueprint templating files, which are gonna become the foundation for the new repository that we're gonna create. Uh, the information that we collect here from the user is gonna be templated into these files, and then our new repo is gonna be pushed and ready to use. Uh, and it's these blueprint files that you can include yourself for your build tooling, your logging, or whatever is needed to create components inside your organization. Uh, so this example here is just one that we ship out of the box with Backstage, um, but we've got a few more like heavyweight examples, things like Create React App and Next.js skeletons and things like that that you can go and check out. But this is just one example, and I'll come on to some more use cases later. So how does this all work, and like, what do they look like under the hood? So I mentioned that creating repositories is just one use case, and this is kind of what I want to focus on here. Uh, so this is what you can see that the node and Next.js skeleton looks like. So we've got a template YAML file and a folder called skeleton, which contains all of the boilerplate files that I was just talking about. And that's the image on the right hand side that you can see. Um, and you'll see there's like package JSON files and basically a structure of what's going to be a very simple, very empty Next.js service. 
So you can either choose to house all of your software templates in one big monorepo, or you can break them out into smaller repositories with different ownership, or a hybrid, which is kind of what we do at Spotify. So let's take a little peek into the template YAML, and this is where we'll come onto the two main concepts of software templates, which are the parameter schema and the step definitions. So this is the parameter schema, and this might look familiar for anyone that's used JSON schema before, and that's because it's exactly that. It is JSON schema, just in YAML. Um, and as you can see from the sample YAML here and the image on the right, we take this JSON schema definition and then produce a form which is going to render an input field for the user to satisfy a bit of that JSON schema. So if you imagine you want a Boolean, you're going to get a checkbox, or if you want a string, you're going to get a text area. A uh, shout out to the guys that maintain this, which is the um, RJSF core team, uh, React JSON schema form. Um, and obviously there's a lot more like opportunity for more advanced things here, but I'm just going to cover some of the simple use cases. The other thing to notice is that this is all React, right? So you'll see the UI field part where it says entity name picker. So that's just a custom field extension, which we'll get onto shortly, but this opens up the ability for integrators to render any custom React component that they choose. So instead of providing like a simple text box, you might want to provide a React component that can call out to an API to get your Kubernetes clusters or something. And then the developer can choose that cluster to deploy into, for example. And then moving on to the step definitions. So this is the main meat of the software template. So this is basically what's going to happen when the uh, user clicks create, and this is the pipeline of steps it's going to go through. So steps are basically an array of actions uh, that are going to take place in sequence. And here you can see we've got three of them. We've got the templating step, the publish step, and the register step. So you can think that these are just basically TypeScript functions behind the scenes. And they're just going to call them with the input that you get in the YAML. Uh, these are also super configurable too, like you can provide your own actions that can do anything you like inside your organization, they're just TypeScript. So just to recap a little bit here what you can do with software templates. So you can write your own blueprints for templating to provide any, like to create any form of repository, whether that be declarative infra, data pipelines, or just something simple. Um, you can create custom field extensions which are going to enrich the experience for your engineers when filling out the form. And of course, you can create your own actions to do any additional logic that you might want to do when running these workflows. So that's enough of the recap. Let's talk about what's new. So I should mention that uh, Scaffolder plugin, which is what powers this whole software template story. Uh, you might have heard references to like Scaffolder Next, Scaffolder Alpha and stuff in the open source repo. And it's all the same thing. It's just a different name. Uh, what I'm going to show you is available for you to test and try out today. We would very much appreciate if you go and test it out and try it because we're going to ship it soon and we don't want to make sure we break anything. Um, and a lot of the work here that we've done uh, came out of an RFC that I actually posted around basically improving uh, the test coverage and the way that we can test the scaffolder itself because as more interest grew for the software templates, so did the amount of pull requests and contributions that came in and it was getting harder and harder to ship things and, and the new features that people wanted. So we spent some time evolving the UI with some of the feedback from end users and also refactoring and writing some more tests uh, to give us more confidence moving forward. Um, it also allowed us to ship some new features, which we're pretty excited about. Um, we bumped the underlying library that I just mentioned uh, that does a lot of the drawing of the, fo of the form for us. So we can do a little bit more complex things with the new JSON schema draft, like if then else and things like that. So hiding forms depending on input from another, for uh, hiding fields depending on another input from another field, for, for, for example. And it's also allowed us to ship async validation for custom field extensions and embedded workflows, which I'm about to show a demo of. All right, I think it's now the demo. So there's a chance that this might not work, but we're going to give, we're going to give it a go. Uh, I just need to join to my personal hotspot because the Wi-Fi here is a little sketchy. Uh, let's go to here. All right. So let me just start this. And let's bring up this. Okay, so what I'm going to show you first um, is the async validation for custom field extensions. So I just want to bring us back here. Can everybody see this, by the way? I do need to make it a bit bigger. Shout at the back. Is it okay? Bigger, okay. One second. And now my screen gets even smaller. One sec. This is going to be fun. All right, this is fine. Now can you see this, right? Hold on, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will make this full screen. Is this better? Yeah, okay. So I'm just going to do it one screen at a time, so it's not going to see side by side, but it's fine. 
So this is what a custom field extension might look like. It's just a React component, right? And we're rendering a little input label here and the actual input field. And this is just movie components, right? So I can just, uh, let's just try and do div, like hello in here. Uh, and then we already have some uh, templates loaded into Backstage already for us to try out. So I'm just going to go to the create part here. I'm going to come back to the tech docs boilerplate thing in a second. But I'm just going to click on this example template here. So we can see we have our little hello thing. It's rendering the extension. That's good. All right. So we have our um, input field here. And right now, well, in the public, in the version that's currently released uh, to the public, we can only do synchronous validation here. So let's think like regex and things like that. Um, but what happens if we've got like some async service that we want to call um, to like go and make sure that this entity that we're trying to create here doesn't exist already? And we've got the catalog for that. So I was, what we're going to do here is uh, add some validation to the field extension to basically call the catalog to make sure that the value that we're providing here doesn't exist already as an entity. So I'm just going to go back and head here. So we can see here that this is uh, the definition of an, a field extension in Backstage. And uh, we have this validation function. Now, right now, this does nothing. Um, there's a few arguments that get passed into this validation function. One of them is the actual value that we have. And the other one is going to be the uh, error context or the validation context. So I'm just going to call this validation. Oop. Oh, my god. <laughs> I have fat fingers, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> Right, so we have our validation function. I like that Copilot is trying to help me out as well here. This is going to be fine. Um, but we're going to just go ahead and um, basically make a call to the catalog to make sure that this thing doesn't exist already. So there's another argument here, which is going to be the API holder. So this is going to allow us to get access to any, any of the APIs in the API context in Backstage. And one of those is the catalog API ref. So I'm going to go uh, catalog API uh, equals... API holder dot get oh, catalog API, and that's not how we use that. Well, let's do this. See, we're nearly right. <laughs> yeah, Copilot was nearly right. <laughs> oh. Okay, I'm then going to import this. This is going to be that. That's going to be great. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, let's do um, const entities equals oh, wait, catalog API dot. Uh, get entities, and then we have our filter. And this is going to be a kind component, so we're going to check for all the component kinds, and we're going to see if the value uh, of the metadata name is the value. Uh, and then if the entities is more, it's getting better now, it's getting, we're getting there. And then we'll do a validation dot add error like this entity already exists. So this is going to be fine. Uh, this also needs to be an async function. OK, I'm hoping that this is going to work. Uh, items. There we go. Thank you, TypeScript. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and try this. So I just want to pop back to the catalog for a second here. So this is like some of the demo and uh, demo entities that we've got. So we have example, web, example website is one entity here. So in theory, if I go back to this and I type Ben, it goes next. That's good. If I type example website, I should get an error. Let's try. No. <laughs> Well, that's fine. <laughs> it does work, please promise. Um, this is fine, right? We can do some debugging together. This should work, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to not trust it. I'm going to do a reload and I'm going to try it again. Example website. Yay! There we go. Right, that's good. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go and create uh, a entity using this template. So let's go. Let's call this Ben Cube Contest, and let's just give it a simple description. Yeah, we don't need this, but anyway. And then I'm going to just put this in my test repo, which is in Blam Demo, and we're going to call it Cube Con One Two Three Four something that I've not created before, so it breaks. And then we go here and we go click create. So this is now going to run um, the workflow for us. It's going to go and fetch these templating files, go and create a repo, and go push it uh, for us. And then go and register it in the catalog. So we can see at the end, we've now got these two outputs. So one's the repo and one's the entry in the catalog. So I'm just going to go, uh, I can just show you the demo of the repo really quickly. There it exists. It does real, it's the real demo. Um, but then I want to go back to the catalog. So I want to talk around the second use case 
uh, of the scaffolder. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Paul um, from Frontside here because he's driven quite a lot of this work for Embedded Workflows and it is cool to show on demo. So I want to pop over to the docs part here. So just a quick show of hands. Has anyone looked to use Backstage ever seen a screen like this before? Yeah, quite a few. So how we basically, how we intertwine plugins and connect plugins to entities is by annotations, right? So this is saying that when I want to use the TechDocs plugin, that I don't have this annotation in my entity YAML. Now, it's a little unfortunate, right? Because we know what it's expecting. It's just that the plugin doesn't have the ability to do this. But there's something that's like really good at editing files and creating repos and pushing repos and pull requests, and it's a scaffolder, right? So why don't we try and use a scaffolder to basically do some of this work for us? So what I want to do now is I'm just going to pop over to the entity page, which is here and uncomment some code. I don't have to write anything this time, which is nice. Um, so I'm just going to uncomment this. So what this is going to do is it's going to use the embedded workflows that we've been building in uh, the software templates. And I need to select all this. Oh, and that one. Now, there we go. Um, what this is going to do now is it's going to basically check to see if that entity does not have that annotation. And if it doesn't, it's going to provide us with a form that's pre-populated. And this looks very similar to the scaffolder. And that's because it is. It's basically an embedded workflow. And it's going to pre-populate it with the information that's needed. And then what this is going to do is it's going to run a workflow on top of the repository. And that consists of going to grab the repository, uh, grab all the contents of the repository, run a transform on the top of that to go and add that annotation to the catalog, uh, catalog info YAML, and then it's going to raise a pull request back. So I'm just going to go through this. We're going to run this in place. We're just going to create this workflow. It's going to go through this. You can see it all running now. It's going to go and fetch the entity, go and add the TechDocs annotations to the YAML, and then it's going to create a pull request for us at, on that repository that we just created. So I'm going to go over here to the pull request. We can see it. I am not going to care about it waiting to build. I'm just going to merge it. That'll be good. I'm actually going to probably show you what it's created first before I merge it. But anyway, <laughs> here we go. So we can see that it's added the annotation for us. And it's also added some sample documentation for us to get set up with TechDocs. So now if I go back to this, if I give this a refresh, now TechDocs is set up automatically for us now. So this is just kind of a specific use case for tech docs, but this, you can see how it can be applied for anything, right? Like we can go and add more, th like we can go and transform people's repositories and go and add code for people so that they don't have to go and do this manual management. We can just delegate this stuff in terms of workflows. And by that, it's just generated some documentation for that entity and that is embedded workflows. Cool, I'm gonna hand back to Patrick now. Actually, no, I have another slide, one second. If I could actually, no, I don't get to pick. There we go. Sorry, one second. Where's the slide gone? <laughs> Where are you? Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. That's not there. Sorry, one second. I'll just open the slides again. On this one? Yeah, they are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hold on. I just need to click this button so we... Yes. There we go. I'll just pop these. There we go. Ah, so, uh, yeah. How do I try it out? So, uh, there's a link here. Um, go ahead. There's some documentation that's all set up here for you to get set up and running with the new scaffolder. Please go and try it out. We want some feedback on it and before we ship it, because uh, it's getting kind of soon. Cool, and I'm going to hand you over to Patrick now to talk about framework updates. Shout out to the demo gods. All right, so recently our focus has been on, sorry, I now know where I am. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have been evolving the backstage core framework. Now. So recently, our focus has been on evolving the Backstage backend system. Uh, at the end of last year, we did a talk at BackstageCon where we presented our plans for a new system. Um, we mentioned our goal was to make it available at the beginning of this year, and we ended up shipping the alpha in February in our 1.11 release. Now, for a deeper dive into this new system, you can go and check that talk out. 
Uh, or if you prefer reading, we now have uh, quite extensive documentation uh, for the new system. So I will give a summary of that talk then. Um, our original backend system was grown out organically uh, with the rest of the project. Unlike the front end, we didn't really have that much of a framework. It was more of a collection of patterns for how to build plugins. The way you install a plugin is up or was up for each plugin to define themselves. Uh, although there was a common set of services for plugins to use um, to keep things a bit consistent. Now, this isn't very scalable. It leads to a setup that is hard to maintain uh, for both adopters and uh, plugin authors. So to, to address this, uh, we set out to evolve the backend system with a couple of high-level go goals. We wanted to simplify the way uh, you install and integrate plugins into your backend. We also wanted to make it much simpler to evolve and extend both plugins and the framework itself without breaking consumers. And we wanted to do this while keeping the system recognizable, both if you're familiar with the backstage front-end framework, but also relying and leaning on the existing patterns uh, instead of inventing from scratch. Now, let's look at a concrete example of how the existing system can be uh, less optimal. In this example, uh, we want to install a new backend pl plugin. So the way you install a, uh, a backend plugin in Backstage, this means you need to copy paste a bunch of code. That's not what we're looking at in this example. What we're looking at here instead is if a plugin that you're installing needs a common service that you don't already have integrated into your backend. So to make this service available, first you need to add a dependency on the package, which is what we see here. Then you need to add a service interface to your plugin environment for everybody to recognize the service. Then you need to wire up the implementation of the service for the plugins to use. So this is like manual dependency injection going on here, right? And then lastly, uh, you have to forward the service from this environment to your plugin uh, that you installed so it can use the service. Now, th this is a mess. And it doesn't even stop here. Because of this complexity, uh, many Plugins added fallbacks uh, in case the service wasn't available. So this both makes backends harder to maintain, but it also makes the plugins harder to maintain too. So this is really one of the things we wanted to kind of improve uh, as part of this new system. So what does this example look like in the new system? Well, for one, we have automatic dependency injection. Uh, your backend code is no longer responsible for doing all of that wiring. Instead, that happens automatically under the hood. We also introduced something we call default service factories, uh, which lets you have plugins provide the default implementations for a service. So in the end, all the changes that were required before are now handled by the plugin and the framework itself, and none of the code that I just showed uh, is necessary in the new system. So here's the new architecture. Quick high-level overview. There is a backend instance uh, which wires everything together. In the backend, you install plugins like the catalog or the scaffolder that Ben just talked about. If the plugins want to communicate with each other, they do that through network calls. So it's microservice architecture, essentially. Uh, and this, uh, of course, uh, allows for a distributed deployment of plugins and, and backends. So to extend the functionality of plugins, you can also install modules. Um, so for example, you can install a custom set of actions for the scaffolder. Modules run in the same context as the plugins, uh, but they communicate through an extension point, which is an indirection to exist to make sure there's a loose coupling between plugins and modules, making them both easier to evolve over time. And in the middle, we have services. They exist to make it easier to build plugins and modules. So you don't have to implement all functionality from scratch. This is things like logging, database access, task scheduling, and so on. Both plugins and modules can use these services, and the backend instance can uh, inject custom service implementations uh, if needed. Now, here we have the code uh, for a minimal backend setup. Uh, in this example, we just have a simple backend instance that where we install the scaffolder plugin, along with two modules that provide additional custom actions for the scaffolder. So it's just one plugin, but you can imagine the middle section of this example here repeated for each plugin that you want to install. I uh, omitted the imports at the top in this example to keep it brief. Now, if you know what a typical backstage backend system looks like, you know that this is a lot less code to manage compared to what we have today. 
And we know, because we counted, down from nine separate files of 348 lines of code, uh, the equivalent is now just 26 lines of code. This gives you an idea of how much simpler it will be to maintain a backstage installation once we move over to this new system. And we released the alpha earlier this year, and you can ex expect a stable release in, um, well, fairly soon. So, <laughs> what are we doing next? Now, 26 lines of code is nice, but it's not as nice as zero. So, this is start, what we've started uh, working on now. It's something that we call declarative integration. This is a feature that has been requested many times, more or less since the beginning of the project. The core of the idea is to be able to install plugins without the need to modify code. Declarative integration is now at the top of our roadmap. Um, what's the scope of the work? We don't know the full scope yet, but we know where we are starting. Uh, what we're working towards is to make it possible to install plugins without writing TypeScript, like I said. And we're doing this for both the front end and the back end. Now, this is still very early work. There's a lot left to do, and we're keeping the initial scope very limited, and there are already plenty of tricky problems to solve. Either way, we're very excited for this new direction of the project and uh, what it's going to unlock for us in the future. And that's it. Hopefully, we have time for questions. Thank you. Does anybody have a question? <laughs> do we have a Listen, microphone? Do we have a microphone? Or do we have to run with microphones? We can repeat it. Uh, yeah. So what's the question? Uh, the question was, uh, TechDocs only supports Markdown right now. Is there uh, any plans to uh, change that, I guess? Um, so there is. I've seen some issues around of like people wanting to add more support for just Markdown and make docs especially. Uh, I'm not really sure where we're at with that issue, to be honest. I, I know it's been explored, but I don't think it's... I, I would say that part of our governance updates is that the TechDocs area is not something that we're um, leading or very involved with. So yeah. you would actually need to check with them yeah. and, and see what the plans are. Yeah. 